Good evening. Thank you all for being here. I'm Susan Crane, director of the museum, and we're thrilled to see all of you for this opening of these four fabulous shows tonight and for Bill Wegman's talk. There are few artists who are as Catholic in their career as William Wegman. He started off as an expressionist painter, and then he became a pioneer of video art and well known as a conceptual prankster. And then he achieved popularity for his staged photographs of his beloved Weimaraner dog, Man Ray. His early process art interventions were featured in landmark and actually quite heady theoretical exhibitions in Europe, such as a very famous one called When Attitudes Become Form in 1969. In the 60s, he was included in most of the major earth art exhibitions as well. Yet he's one of maybe the only artists in the art historical canon of his era who also appeared on The Johnny Carson Show and Sesame Street. Bill's work is very deeply rooted in thinking about art and thinking about the quirks and accomplishments of art and art history. His work has a rather vibrant liberal streak and is anti-heroic in absolutely every way. At the same time, it's so very respectful of the artist that he pays homage to. It's always dead on telling. It's one part existential and it's leavened by one part humor and sometimes absolutely transparent silliness, which delights us all. Everything in Wegman, Wegman's world is an episode on a stage, and his puns, which are both visual and often sometimes literal, kind of remind us that many things in life seem very arbitrary. One of my favorite works in the show upstairs is a very tiny little painting. It's nine by 12 inches. It's a postcard of the Mona Lisa, which you all know and can picture in your mind. And he has painted it out, he's painted out Leonardo's landscape to the edges of a panel. And of course, the original Mona Lisa is on a poplar panel. It's nine by 12 inches, and it's called reformatted to fit. <laughs> and nine by 12, of course, is the aspect ratio of video. So he's reformatted this Renaissance portrait to the frame that we see the contemporary world through, or the, our window on the world through television and through all the screens that we look at perpetually, every day. Wegman was born in Holyoke, Massachusetts, and he went to Mass College of Art in Boston, and then he went out to the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana in 1967. He taught at the University of Wisconsin, and it being the late 60s, he ended up in Southern California where he taught briefly and spent a few years and got his first Weimaraner, Man Ray. He's made videos for Saturday Night Live, for Nokia, for Nickelodeon, and Sesame Street. His film in 1995 called The Hardly Boys was screened at the Sundance Film Festival. In 2006, Yale University Press published a beautiful monograph on his work, and he let us know today that there's a book of his writings that's about to come out. So, um, Bill, could you please come up and give us um, even more insights into your kind of amazing breadth of your career? Thank you for being here. That was really nice. I uh, will probably need help to advance these slides, or at least a lesson in how to do this. Um, they're not called slides anymore, are they? They're called something else, whatever. <laughs> these were made during the slide era. <laughs> um, so, okay. So now I got the tutorial, and I'm ready to begin a little retrospective of uh, my work since, I guess, 1970 would be the first work here. Um, I was just out of grad school and uh, I had a, was teaching in Wisconsin and a student taught me how to print and develop and then I moved to California and got a dog and that's where we'll start. <laughs> so. And this was the first photograph I ever took before, while I was still in Wisconsin, before I moved and got that dog and uh, it's the best photograph I've ever taken. I never did a better one. I never studied photography, so I didn't know how to achieve this zone system that uh, Ansel Adams talks about and which is represented so wonderfully by this photograph. 
but it jumped out and it gave me the courage to stop doing performances, installation pieces. This was during the 60s when everyone was doing, if they were doing paintings, they would call it a wall piece or their sculptors would do a floor piece. Well, you know, it was, and it was part of the peace movement era, so, <laughs> so uh, th this is my salami piece anyway, and it's, uh, it looks like an, it's an addition of five, but it's an addition of one, because I didn't addition the salami, it just, it just stayed there. Uh, but it really uh, affected me, and, uh, and it, it led me to this next work, which is one of my early ones with my little puppy that I had no idea what to do with, but took to my studio. Uh, I named this, this creature Man Ray, because he looked like an old man, and he was in a ray of light. And I ended up calling him not Man, but Ray. So when I got the next dog, it became Faye, so this is the Ray. And I did things not like I ended up doing later on for uh, Sesame Street and so forth, like dressing him. He was just a dog. And uh, he was more of a, I like to think of him as a space modulator. Um, I was thinking about Moholy Naj then, so that, that's a good term. And in my videos with him, he was, riv he was just riveted to both me and the instrument. I think because they're hunting dogs, they like, uh, the cameras like um, serious equipment. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it was really that. Oh, Bill's setting up this stuff. We better, you know, come over here. And here's another, one of my early studios in San Pedro, California. And uh, it gave me a, a lot of clues about photography. It's, it's only interesting to a few people. Um, we could break up in, smaller groups later and discuss this and I can move on to the next. But it's about the nature of photography. I tried to double everything in this picture, but it was useless because when you work in a space and things become flat, you learn uh, a, a lot about it. So this is, this is one of those. And this is, I think, more um, successful as a photograph and everyone likes this one, right? Because it's also about the nature of photography and uh, what's funny about it and what's interesting. And obviously that, that middle photograph was not taken at the same time as the last one, was it? No. <laughs> so I didn't, I used myself in these photographs not because I was so handsome and good at it, but because I was the only one around. No, I couldn't get anyone to, to do that. So you see me many times stepping on a little bubble to make these pictures. And I think that bubble, I'm squeezing it, actually, to take the picture uh, in my right hand. My left hand was the glass which dropped, or right hand. And this is a, an important work to me because it led me out of minimalism, which I had been thought of and thought of myself as, into something more, um, I guess you would call postmodernism. So, you know, the, it's, it, it has a different uh, look to it. It didn't have the soloit look or, or the kind of clean thing. It had something going on there, something a little wrong or whatever. It's, this is my poor uh, first wife, Gail, who talked me into getting the dog in the first place, and then I would make her be in these pictures, and she, she hated doing that. And uh, what she did. And this is uh, a student of mine was married to a uh, identical twin, and this is Lynn and Terry. They're two twins, one through one twin. And uh, I mapped Lynn's marks on Terry, or, or so forth, so. And this is me with uh, Terry's, Lynn's husband, Tim. Tim's bigger than me, so he has the bigger tools. And little Bill has the smaller tools. And so you could see how I'm thinking about photography and how to build a work. It kind of comes out of installation and performance, but it isn't really. It, it presents itself as, a, as an idea, and there it is. You could figure it out and move on. And another thing, really, I think if I hadn't, if I had studied photography, I would never have stumbled upon these odd little things that happen in, in photo, photography. Um, I say, uh, one or two spoons, two or three forks, because who knows for sure what those are. Um, 
I guess one of them could have been a knife, too, but I didn't think of that. I have to go change that. I'll be right back. <laughs> and three mistakes. You know, this is... I started to... Uh, I was very careful not to write on my photographs. I, for some reason, I thought that was uh, cheating, so I would photograph, I would type the words, photograph the type, and then kind of double expose them into these pictures. So they had this clean photographic look. And they were all on 11 by 14. I didn't want to do big wall works. I wanted them to be, and I thought it was very shrewd. I wanted them to be the size that would reproduce in a, in a magazine or a book or be on a wall and be the same. Uh, these big giant photographs, when they're reproduced small, you're always apologizing for them. But with this one, it's fine big like this, or it's fine small in a book. You get it, and you don't, you're not involved in all of these other qualities. That really appealed to me then. <laughs> Can you do that? <laughs> it's called reading two books. So. And then I started in, in the... Around 1972, I started to, I had been doing videos, uh, some with the dog, some without, in these photos. And I was, wanted to get back to really simple materials, just like sitting at a desk, either writing a word or making a drawing. So there's all these drawings on typing paper, and I'll show a few of those now. They're all pretty much from the, they're all done with a number two pencil on typing paper. So again, they're like the photographs, you, you get them. They do have quality, but they don't have qualities. <laughs> and then, okay, I'll go back to this. this uh, somebody gets it, one person gets it, two people. Can I have three? Can I have one over there? Uh, it's like an auction. And then, uh, then I did these altered photographs in the mid-70s. After Here's what happened. I got a, started to get well-known. I got a Guggenheim. I got a, a lot of money. I bought a Hasselblad, and I took crappy pictures. I used to use a twin-lens camera, which was slow to set up. And then I had this sexy thing, so I took a lot of pictures with it, and they were terrible. So rather than throw them away, I started to write and paint on them. So these are from the later 70s, from 1975 on. And this is... a. Uh, a little boy at a logging convention in Tofty, Minnesota, and I painted in the character on this TV set, which I double exposed into the frame. It's like a, it could be in that surveillance show as well, don't you think? <laughs> um, oh, finally, the dog, so. Um, yeah, we left Man Ray really quite sad on that floor there in the puddle of milk, so I didn't bring many pictures of him. I'm sorry to say, I do uh, think a lot about this dog. He was pretty amazing, and probably this, you know, I, I got him way too young. He was six weeks old. You're supposed to wait until a dog is eight weeks, so he never thought he was a dog, and he was with me all the time, and uh, he was great to work with, really fun. This is later when he was eight years old at the Polaroid Studio in Cambridge, Mass., and it was the first color photograph that I took, I had this sort of uh, manifesto where I wouldn't do color, or do anything bigger, bigger than uh, 8 by 10 or 9 by 11. But this was in color and it was 2024, 20, so it sort of broke my manifesto. It's called Fay Ray, which later you know, became something else. And <clears throat> these, these works change in a way because I guess they get funnier, they get more pictorial, they're in color, they're... they're uh, some are beautiful, like this one. This is a, a double profile of this beautiful model that I had, Hester. And uh, I actually put false eyelashes on Man Ray, but I didn't really have to. It's not really, it's not about that. And then this was just the last picture. Sadly, he didn't survive this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And uh, oh, there he is. Uh, so this is almost embarrassing, this picture. It's very anecdotal, and it is like a genre picture. So it has a whole different 
life. And I never really knew what I was going to do. We would take this giant camera up in Maine. It was as big as a refrigerator. It has to have uh, be 69, 70 degrees. It, you know, it was really a beast to, to use. But I, I, I used this for a while. This I imagined to be Man Ray's last photograph. I would just send him out on Kinnebago Lake and then drive back to New York. And I did go and get him. And this is another one of my favorite pictures. It's called Dusted, where it seems to look like uh, both a Jimmy Durante and Philip Guston, uh, early Philip Guston painting. And this is my, the new dog, Faye, and there she is coming out of this box. She, was, she got to be at the Polaroid studio when she was in her prime. She was just like two years old here, rather than Man Ray was um, eight or nine, so he didn't have that kind of a physique that, that this dog has. And she's very, you know, she was very different from Faye, uh, from Man Ray. She was more vulnerable, more thoroughbred, too. I think he, she, he, she probably would have gotten better grades from the Weimar Honor judge at the dog show than Man Ray. Uh, and here's my version of, uh, of the Man Ray piece, which uh, this is with another assistant, Andrea. And there you can see her false eyelashes show up in this one. And, it, you know, it's, it's very different from the Man Ray one, but it's still a similar subject. And there, that is one dog. <laughs> and that's not one dog, that is two dogs. And when Faye had puppies, puppies, I had a chance to really explore a lot of different spatial and, and uh, narrative uh, situations and I ended up doing children's books and doing stories for Sesame Street and uh, I had a whole uh, troupe with Faye and she had eight puppies but three of them I became close to. And this was Faye who, who loved to work and she was so proud that she was with William Wegman, the famous photographer, dog <laughs> photographer, that she, she really worked it, you know. She, <laughs> I'm doing this uh, version of an Archimbaldo here, and she really showed me that I could hook something on her tooth right there, and uh, happy to do so. And there's her, <laughs> probably the best photograph ever taken of a Weimar runner. <laughs> and this is her daughter, Batty. You can see how different she is. Like, Batty, Batty was more um, uh, just whatever. And with, with Faye, you, you, uh, you know, she's serious. You, don't, you never laugh at her. If you do, you feel you laugh privately. You don't laugh in front of her. But uh, it's okay to laugh at this one. She's like sweet and pretty and adorable and comic. And there she is with her puppy, Chip, at one day old. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So, and there he is six months later playing the flute. That is. <laughs> Like these dogs develop, like a human, a human at six months would not be able to play the, f the flute. No matter how hard you try to teach this human how to play the flute, you would have to be like 10 or so to do it. So, so and there's, uh, that was the first dressed up picture I did with, I, this is a little out of order, first dressed up picture I took of, of a dog that was, uh, you know, because I was embarrassed to do so. But it was so weird and creepy that it seemed fine. As long as it's creepy and weird and the dog looks like something out of mythology rather than, you know, a cute kind of thing. And then, you know, really scary, right? This is uh, Joan Crawford would be uh, jealous of, of the power of this fierceness as, as I cast her as the evil stepmother in uh, Cinderella. And other, this is uh, Batty's sister, Crooky, who was one of the stars of my little movies and so forth. And she's like a miniature fae, this dog. But great, great to work with. And here's, uh, here's Chundo, the uh, fae's son with Batty uh, in a uh, scene from a book that never <clears throat> developed of the Har Hardly Boys. I did make a, a film called The Hardly Boys. And another scene from uh, a proposed book and if you think of this, this is probably the most amazing photograph any of you here have ever seen. 
but you probably uh, aren't thinking about that. That's why I'm here to tell you about it. <laughs> this giant camera, which is bigger than the, this whole podium, is on a dock, and there's two dogs in a boat with no people <laughs> going right by the dock perfectly to, to be... Uh, to be photographed. How does that happen? I have no idea. I was there, but I don't know how it happened. <clears throat> so after a, a lot of these story things, I got back into doing more formal things, things that uh, I know a sculptor might make. You know, I started to work with, uh, with paper and the dog. These are again with a giant Polaroid camera. So. I suppose it would be easy with Photoshop, but it's not with Polaroid. And I like that it was a little difficult. And I never Photoshop even, even now because that would be cheating. I like that the dogs are cooperating, that they're there, that you're building the picture together. It's, uh, you know, it's just a wonderful experience to do, to do this. This is with uh, three of the dogs in front of set paper you know, that I just cut. So different ways of spending a lifetime looking at them and thinking what, what they are and what they can be. <clears throat> this looks like a black and white photograph, but it isn't. It's kind of weird, isn't it? And this is, this is crazy. This dog, it wasn't my dog. It was one of my assistants. It was a charcoal gray Weimaraner, they're called Blues, who loved the strobe light. And when she would visit me, she'd just hop up onto a table thinking I'd be taking her picture. I think she was addicted to the strobe. So uh, you can see that she likes this. And there she is again. You can see how dark she is. I had a lot of fun working with her. She loved to work, too. It was just as good as, as my dog's, but she wasn't my dog. And there's Candy, and uh, she looks uh, encapsulated there. And a and, uh, recent dog, Penny, who uh, looks like a cute little toy there, right? And Bobbin. Penny's father, uh, leaning against a sheet of uh, plexiglass. And then I took some pictures just with my own um, Hasselblad camera out on, uh, this is out on Baker Island in Maine, off the coast of Maine. <clears throat> so we would just go and find a set, and a site, and then take these pictures. And that's, Candy was uh, the least photogenic of my dogs, but she did like to do athletic things, so she was pretty cool that way. And then there's another artist I wanted to show you his work. His name is Wegman, and uh, <laughs> he's, uh, he did these things in the mid-80s. <clears throat> my brother. And when I started to paint, I was a little bit uh, afraid of um, painting. I had spent a lifetime, well, I had spent my youth painting and I went to art school and got into photography and all of that other stuff. <clears throat> but I really loved to paint and then when I started to paint I needed to think of what was, well, what's a suitable subject for painting? Well, canvas and tents, you know, because they look like Cezanne and they're on canvas and uh, they look a little bit like cubism. So this was something that was a suitable subject. The other one here, was oil, refinery, and uh, paintings of, painting of color seemed okay. So I'm kind of apologizing to myself because I love to paint, but I'm not really sure why I'm doing it. I'm cutting the telephone lines because I don't want people to really know about it. So that's why the line is down there. And this, you know, I made, I sort of botched the, 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 uh, the tree so I, uh, they look like it looked like hair, so I put a bobby pin in. So you would think, well, of course he made the the tree hairy on purpose. So I found myself enjoying making games, uh, you know, with with the painting. And I got a hold of a postcard and turned it into this weird melon. So again, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, visual games. And here's a postcard where you can see where I extrapolated these figures, perhaps. And this is, uh, the people in the foreground were, were at a, a golfing event, and I imagine that they're looking at this architecture. I love uh, Ranchamp, it's a very important building to me. I've never seen it, but that and falling water, I love classic architecture. 
for some reason. It's a, my version of pop art, I guess. And this has some other art references mixed in. And uh, I found myself kind of reinventing, when I use these postcards, uh, surrealism sometimes, sometimes other, other art forms. It's a detail of that. Fortunately, there's a lot of paintings in this show, and you don't have to look at these crappy reproductions. <laughs> so. I like sometimes the challenge of combining two very disparate cards was inspiring to me, as in this case. And sometimes they're kind of silly or effective. This is very effective, an effective use of a postcard, I'd say. This is kind of a joke. This could have been in the artist show. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of like um, amateur, I call it amateur cubism, because there's amateur like Rock, Rockport, Massachusetts painters, but they're doing kind of a cubism. So I thought that was funny. But it isn't just that things are funny, they also have to be beautiful in some way or right. The cards, I like them to be lost, to get lost. Uh, this card has a very strange group of a Viennese um, <coughs> palace, a Wesleyan uh, student center, and a fascist Italian postcard. All three of these cards are in this, and there's a close up of the Wesleyan dude there. So I like to, uh, and there's the other part of it. So there's three cards in this painting. And here's a weird one with this photograph of some skiers, and I replaced the characters uh, in this interior. Oh, maybe it's sort of like a Beckett play. Let's stage it. Who wants to be the blonde guy in the in the middle with a glove. And who wants to be the Degas? Do I see anyone here that looks like that lady in the foreground? You can meet later. <laughs> this is one of my more successful artists, including me, pieces. And uh, it's the, in the collection of my art dealer, one of my art dealers, Angela Westwater. She liked it so much she bought it. But I like my favorite part of it is the Pollock uh, embedded in the floor there. Is the, <laughs> you know, yeah. I had a lot of fun extending these, uh, these paintings as well. So half the job is done. You know, I just have to dinker around. And I'm just going to end with, uh, well, I'm going to end with one short video. But I'm going to almost end now with some rather spiritual photographs of my uh, wonderful dogs here that are Penny and uh, Penny and her mother Candy. And there's Candy is in there somewhere, or Penny, I can't tell which. Looks like spirit photography, right? And then Flo in doing her lovely ballet. <coughs> and uh, Flo again showing, showing the effect of this. And Topper, who's lovely, and this is kind of a tricky pose uh, to get a dog to balance on one <laughs> foot like that. You can see how serious he is. He's trying to be, to be good, right? That's good. He's a good dog. And there's the two of them. This is not photoshopped. They're in the same set. And this photograph is upstairs. You can see this. That's Flo. Flo again. I just love this dog. I love working with both these dogs. They're very different from my earlier ones in that they, they won't lie down flat. I'll never do a dog alphabet with them, but I can put them up on things. You just have to know what they're good at. Should we end there? <laughs> no, we'll end here. Here we go. We And then the crash. That You just missed your cue. So, boink. <laughs> So um, I'm going to show a little video of, uh, <clears throat> that I made in 98 
uh, called Installed Guitar. It does re relate to art somewhat. It's with this funny dog, Batty, who you saw as, uh, you know, in that, in that uh, Lolita-looking chair and so forth. There you go. have time for some questions if you would like to ask me anything. And I've been asked to repeat the question when I hear it. How do you get your dogs to stay in one place? Like, all your like yeah, how do I get them to stay in one place? Uh, when I work with a Polaroid camera, it's a big stationary camera. You don't bring it to them. So I got used to bringing them and putting them up on tables or getting them up to a certain height. Uh, and I think they're just very, and they like knowing where they're supposed to be. Uh, and so that's how I do it. And the fact that I do it more than once, not just for the Christmas card or for the birthday joke, I do it regularly. They get, okay, well, this is the studio. Here's the, the lights. Here's Jason, the assistant, and there's Jake, and there's, you know, some stuff. So that, that's, they get geared up for it. I don't get, do I give them treats? No, because I don't like lurch and drool. I like, uh, I like them to dissolve into themselves. I like them <clears throat> occasionally, I need a look and I might throw something or drop something or get them to do that. But <clears throat> I did, in my book, my movie, Hardly Boys, I did smear cheese on a book to make them look like they're looking at it. So, you know, <clears throat> I need some water. I've had uh, four dogs um, is, uh, last February, and the two old ones, some of which you've seen here, passed away. They were 15 and, and uh, 14. So, but I've had, I photographed and worked with 10 dogs in particular. <clears throat> Man Ray, Fay Ray, Batty, Crookie, Chundo, Penny, Chip, Bobbin, <clears throat> Flo, Topper. It'll be a quiz. <laughs> Sorry. You said that the dogs like to work with them. The one you said is very good to work with is very uh, athletic. Yeah. So what's, what determines that? Well, the, the dog, the question was not all the dogs want to work. <clears throat> and uh, this one in particular, Candy, uh, wanted to work, but as soon as she'd be up there, she would duck. So she would never show you her face. I think probably she didn't like the light when the strobe went off, so she would avoid that. But when I would throw her through the air, she was, or balance her on a dock, she liked that. She kept running up to me, throw me again. And then when she was, <clears throat> and then when she was done, she didn't come back. She goes, okay, we did enough of that. <coughs> and she would always come to the studio and act like she wanted to work, but then, eh, maybe not. Um, in your early black and white work, you didn't seem to emphasize the craft or the aesthetics of, of making a photograph. And, and then you, in the later work, it seems like you're much more concerned about composition and, and color and aesthetics of the photograph itself. Can you yeah. talk about the transition from one to the other and how you yeah. think about that? <clears throat> Mr. Selwyn was asking me a question about decadence, I believe. And... Uh, <laughs> and 
<clears throat> try to answer it. Um, I first, I wasn't trained in photography, so I didn't know how to do it. I also had an aversion to photography. I didn't want to be good at it. I didn't necessarily make them crappy. I just didn't try very hard to make them uh, good. And in fact, I think they're really stronger that way to, for being not so good, you know. Um, then Polaroid came around and that all of those values were given to me free. And uh, even when I tried to um, subvert them, uh, eventually they sort of broke through and, oh, well, this is beautiful. I, I should, that, that double portrait I did with Hester, uh, I really almost tore that up because it was such a different kind of picture, much more romantic and luscious and all of the things that I tried to avoid. But I kept it and I'm glad I did. You know, that's just opened up. But now when I'm working with, uh, with the digital format, the thing that I have to make sure we all know is that they're not Photoshop, that the dogs are really cooperating, uh, that they're there um, <clears throat> in that space. And somehow I also kind of fell in love with, uh, with working with these colors that you, can, that you can get now. The Polaroid camera had really beautiful sum colors. The camera was designed for white people who wore red, uh, not landscapes or anything like that. Like browns and greens looked horrible. But uh, white people's birthday parties were just what the whole company was all about. <clears throat> and, and that translated to, you know, when I was using it too, if you notice any of the, the greens and things that I've used in, in those are really kind of creepy and acidic looking. In the back. I'm sorry, which picture? In, that I just showed? Oh, dusted. That was uh, flour, yes. It was just flour that I sprinkled. I got up on top of a ladder and sprinkled it down on him. I was making him into a raccoon, and I was sprinkling a little flower on his nose. And you could see, if I showed you that again, these bronze stripes that I had painted on his to make him look like a, uh, like a raccoon. Well, uh, the question was about, she, she noticed a doubling in a lot of the pictures, and yes, there was, uh, I was really fascinated by, uh, like, find the differences, puzzles, and uh, things like that when I first started to make these photographs, so that was part of the, <clears throat> the interest, and then I, ha you know, I happened upon this set of twins that I got close to, so that, so that was there. And then somehow the, the look of, of diptychs and multiple panel photographs, maybe because I came out of minimal conceptual art, that seemed right. So it was not, you weren't making a window, you weren't making a picture, you were making a piece. So it probably is a vestige of that. Yeah. Well, the, the Weimar runner is great. Is, I chose it kind of by accident, but once I started, the fact that they want to work uh, is super important. The fact that they don't look too doggy, that they're gray and neutral, and gray goes with anything. It's like the classic suit. You can, uh, <laughs> that has a lot to do with it. But really, the, bet, the most important thing, and the reason why I'm, I can still walk, is they want to do that. You know, they're, they're big, strong dogs. If they didn't want to, I wouldn't be able to, to make them do it. So they ask me. They're, it's like the son of Sam, you know, only in a benign situation. So. <laughs>
Hmm. No, uh, she's asking about the postcards. Do I find them? Uh, I, the first ones that I used, I had in my collection up in Rangeley, Maine, and I did a nature book parody, and, and that was that. But, <clears throat> but then I would come across other ones, and now people give me their entire collection. I have thousands of postcards, and I don't really care about any of them <laughs> at all. Uh, I do photocopy the backs, so I preserve that information. Charmingly, I found uh, one that was uh, that my sister, who's now 65, sent to my grandmother when she was seven. Uh, and it was so sweet, and uh, I was glad I didn't glue that before I, I uh, saw that. So, But th they don't mean anything to me. I do know more about postcards than I need to, but there's lots of different types, and sometimes I'm challenged to do ones. At first, I just could do landscape ones that where I could make these sky water things, and then I found the Kandinsky group and then I, you know, other things led to different things. And now I have too many to stop. I'm going to finish using them, all of them. So, so I'm stuck with that. Back there? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. She asked about the Sesame Street alphabet. Well, I was making uh, with these four dogs, Faye and, and her three offspring that I worked with, I was making these sort of abstract shapes, photographing them from above in my studio that was quite tall. And I made curved lines with them, and someone said, oh, that looks like a O, and then O. So I made the whole alphabet, and then I took it to another studio with even taller ceilings and made them uh, uh, filmed them from above, and so when you run the film backwards, it looks like they made the letters themselves, that they just kind of collapsed into, into the letter, and that was what Sesame Street <coughs> we used for those, for that. I really like Robert Cumming, who was a, a, a classmate of mine at Illinois and a student of Art Sinsabaugh. Uh, I used to argue with both Art Sinsabaugh and Cummings that photography wasn't art, and it's kind of funny. Uh, but he, I think he was, he's great. He's, you know, we both went to Mass Art together in the University of Illinois. We're not lovers, but uh, he, and then we moved to California at the same time. No, they're wonderfully archival. So if you buy one, you can expect it to, to last as much as six years. Uh, they're, uh, you know, if, if you put them in your beach house, they'll get fried in like a month. But, um, you know, it, it is what it is, I guess. Uh, the early, the black and white Polaroids are very archival. Um, if you keep them out of the light, they're pretty good. Um, I don't know, I'm sort of a relieved uh, to be d doing the digital, which is super archival now. It's easier, it's more fun. Uh, it's, it's in some way, it's not the same type of artifact though. There's other problems like with a Polaroid, there was one, it's one, you know, there's one and, it, and it's, they're hard to do and there it is, amazing. <clears throat> uh, can you, would you be able to photocopy them and make additions then, who knows? I don't know, there are all of those things. Uh, photography is all corrupt with all of those those problems. Uh, what was it like to go from being like a conceptual artist to suddenly being like a pop figure now for like just one subject? You know, is that strange to be like suddenly now less for what you've been doing? Yeah. Well, in 1978, I, I w didn't. I chose not to photograph my eight-year-old dog Man Ray at all. And uh, in fact, instead, I was in my studio making prison art and doing cocaine. So that was the worst year of both of our lives. He would come into my studio and go, oh, God. And uh, it was really bad. So I was happy when I got out of that and, and just said, OK, you're here. Let's go do stuff. And, and I'm happy with that. And you know, uh, when I first started to do paintings, I remember uh, a writer from the New York Times came to a show that I had, Holly Solomon, she, 
Grace Gluck was her name, she said, you know, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't you. In other words, these paintings don't uh, warrant me coming here writing about them, but because you're William Wegman, the dog guy, then, you know, that's, that's why I can write about them. But that's fine, I don't care, anything is, is okay. I'm pretty happy uh, with, with uh, the way things are now. And I've been working so long in both painting and photography and whatever, that there is these big, uh, it doesn't look like it's, I did it for this class. You know, it doesn't look like student work now. It looks like there's big lines and they've kind of come together in a way. I'm happy about that. Was it um, Man Ray who had a thing for beach back then? Yes, Man Ray loved the beach. And the reason I thought of that piece is talking about the spelling lesson. <clears throat> we lived a block from the beach in, in Santa Monica and then sadly moved to New York. And uh, but we were doing a project at the Everson Museum in Syracuse, and I was looking for um, um, Walnut Street, but we passed Beach Street. And when I said it out loud, he went nuts. <laughs> so I him in Syracuse, and I said, Beach, Cherry, Walnut. And then he was wondering why he was so crazed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because of his love of the beach. The California dog. Um, you know, I think I'm pretty immersed in these, uh, these paintings. Lately, I've been doing some paintings with books uh, instead of the postcards. They're books that I embed in the paintings. So that's the latest things I'm, I'm doing. But I don't know how long that'll last. I've got lots of things to do. Is that good enough for tonight? All right. Thank you. Thank you.